Let me ask you, what if in the blink of an eye, millions of people all over the earth disappeared and were gone? What if a large coalition of nations gathered from the north of Europe and part of Africa and tried to invade Israel? What if a huge asteroid started falling from space and hit the earth? Did you know that all of these events are predicted to happen in the future according to the Bible? Today, three biblical scholars who know Greek and Hebrew and have written 157 books between them are our guests. They are Dr. Mark Hitchcock, Dr. Ron Rhodes, and Jeff Kinley. It is interesting that in the polls of the Pew Research Center, they show that four in 10 Americans believe we are living in the last days. Further, they found out that 70% of evangelical Christians believe Christ could return during their lifetime. Where does the Bible talk about these things? Today, you will find out on this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and we have three of the best biblical scholars in our country with us today, and I'm so glad that you've joined us. We're talking about the Pew Research, and how many people believe that we're living in the end times? It's a surprise when you see those numbers. And today we're going to talk about what does the Bible actually say about the end times? And when is Christ going to return? And what are the events that are going to take place? And uh, first of all, let's talk about we've got Jesus coming at the rapture and we've got what is called the second coming of Christ. At the rapture, Christ comes in the air and brings believers up to him. And at the second coming, he comes back to earth and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives and then he does battle with the nations. There's no signs for the rapture and there's a ton of signs for the second coming. That's just a general gist. You've got some more things that you can tell them just briefly and then we want to get to different views that people have on the rapture. If you hold to a different view than what we're talking about, I'm glad that you tuned in to us. We're not going to argue with you, but we're going to ask you to consider some things the Bible says and think about them. We all grew up in different churches, so different churches have taught different things, or some of their pastors didn't want to get into Revelation because they didn't know it themselves, or it's too hard or it's too controversial, and so you've never heard some of this stuff. Today, you're going to hear it, and I hope we'll do it in a kind way and you'll consider what we're saying. Let's start with the differences that we believe the Bible clearly says about the rapture that Jesus comes and takes all believers and the second coming when he comes to earth and fights the battle of Armageddon. Talk about it, Mark. That's right. Yeah, we're not here to attack these other views. We just simply want to present what we believe the Bible says. And we believe the Bible presents some very irreconcilable differences between what we call the rapture and the return. You mentioned a couple of these already. At the rapture, he comes in the air. Um, at the return, he comes all the way back to the earth. Um, at the rapture, he comes for his saints. At the return, he's going to come with his saints. Um, at the rapture, Christ is going to come and claim his bride as the bridegroom. At the return, uh, Christ is going to come back with his bride. He's going to bring his bride with him. Uh, for the rapture, there are no signs. It's, it's pictured as an event that can happen in any moment of time, whereas the second coming has a long litany of signs that Jesus gave that will portend um, its coming. At the rapture, believers are going to be removed from this earth. At the return, the unbelievers are going to be removed. They're going to be taken away to judgment. Um, at the rapture, Christ comes to reward, according to 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Um, at, the, at the return, He comes back to judge. Um, at the rapture, it involves believers only, whereas this return of Christ involves Israel and all the Gentile nations, which, you know, the, the rapture, there, there's no reason for believers to be here on earth during that time, and God is dealing again with Israel and the Gentile nations. Here's a really important one. The rapture is going to occur in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. 
It's going to be an event that's going to happen as fast as you can snap your fingers. Whereas the return of Jesus back to the earth will be visible to the entire world. Every eye is going to see him. So it may last some very extended uh, period of time. And then after the rapture, the tribulation period begins, that time of judgment, whereas after the second coming, the millennium begins. So we could go on and on with more of these, but I hope that's just a little bit of a taste of how these, these two phases of Christ's coming can't be happening at the same time. They're going to be separated by a period of at least seven years that we call the tribulation period. Yeah, and the fact is it's not necessarily our views. These are what we have gotten from the Bible. This is why we hold it. And so we're asking you, as we're going to put these verses up on the screen, for you to read it for yourself in your own Bible. And you decide. And so that's where we're coming from today. And I want to take one view that, uh, well, we've been talking about the whole time. Let's start with the pre-tribulational view. That is, the rapture comes and then the tribulation comes later. God takes all of his saints out of the earth here, and the fact is, later on, the tribulation happens. So it's called pre-tribulation rapture. And Jeff, tell us a little bit more. Yeah, sometimes these terms, John, sound very technical, they sound very theological, but they're just simply words used to describe things that are taught in the Bible. And that's the most important question we can ask is, what does the Bible say? So the pre-tribulational view, pre just means before or prior, tribulation means that Christ returns to rescue His bride before God pours out His wrath on the earth. So the real question is, will Christians endure the wrath of God during the tribulation period. The pre-tribulational view says, no, Christ will return before that time. Now, and the key thing about the pre-trib view, John, is that it preserves this idea of imminency or the idea that Christ could return at any time. It's unpredictable. It's unpredictability really is what makes it unique. So the pre-trib rapture, Christ rescues his bride before the tribulation period. Yeah, and then Mark, when we get into the tribulation, there are some people say that, you know, the uh, rapture doesn't happen until the middle of the tribulation. So it's way different. Tell us what it means. Well, all these views all hold that we're exempt from God's wrath because that's what the Bible says. We're not appointed to wrath. It's just when does the wrath start and how does God rescue it for us from that? So what mid-tribulation believers, what they would say is, they would say Jesus comes back at the midpoint, at the three and a half year point of that seven year tribulation to rapture the church to heaven. So they would say that the first three and a half years of the tribulation isn't God's wrath. It's just man's wrath. It's, it's wars and famines and, and things like that that are taking place. So that's not really the wrath of God. That's the wrath of man. But the wrath of God is confined to that last three and a half years. Now they often equate uh, the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15. It says Christ is going to come, the last trumpet's going to sound. And they equate that often with the last of the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation. That's in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. But the problem with that is the trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15 is for the church. It's a trumpet of grace. Whereas the trumpet in Revelation chapter 11 is for those who've rejected God. And it's a trumpet of judgment. So these are, these are different trumpets. And the other thing is that the whole seven-year period appears to be God's wrath. Because even the seal judgments in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, those are opened by Jesus. Yeah. So to, to try to limit the wrath of God to the second half of the tribulation doesn't <laughs> seem to fit. The, the whole time period is, is wrath. Now, it does get worse as you go along. It's like birth pains. It's going to increase in intensity and frequency as we go along. But the whole time period is God's wrath. Good explanation. And uh, then let's move on to the post-tribulation view. How do folks say that it comes after the tribulation in terms of all of the verses we've been talking about with the rapture that says we're saved from the wrath to come? Well, they would basically say that at the end of the tribulation, uh, the church will be caught up to meet Christ in the air and then accompany him all the way back down to the earth. Of course, that contradicts John 14, verses 1 to 3, yep. which says that we will be taken to the Father's house. Right. Post-tribs would say that Christians are in the tribulation period. You see that in the text itself. Therefore, the church must not have been raptured. 
That is easily answerable because we believe that even though the church is raptured before the tribulation, new people will become new Christians during the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Post-tribs will also say that, you know, Christ is going to keep all of his people through this wrath of God. And he's going to protect them. The problem is, is that many of the judgments are indiscriminate in nature. Asteroids, earthquakes, all kinds of bad things falling upon the earth. Famine. You know, there's going to be martyrdom, Revelation 6. And so it, it hardly seems like the church is being kept through. The biblical text says that they will be kept out of the period itself, Revelation 3.10. And furthermore, I think that the idea of imminency is so critically important. You know, if post-tribulationism is true, we can essentially count down to the rapture with seven years' worth of signs. And you can do away with imminence. But imminence is a biblical doctrine. You see it throughout the New Testament. Jesus would come at any time. He could come at any time. Doesn't need but signs. But he, he can't come at any time if post-tribulationism is true. Right. Now, this is an in-house debate. It's an in-family debate. We love our brothers who are of a different view. But the biblical text must be considered. And the biblical text supports these ideas we're talking about. Yeah, let's go back to John 14 in terms of the post-tribulational view. The fact is Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If right. it were not so, I told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So Jesus says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. That's where we believe he is right now. Right. Now, he's been in a 2,000 year building project here. Where? Not in Boston, in heaven, in the Father's house. And he says, I'm coming from there to receive you unto myself, and where I am, that there ye may be also. Now, where is Jesus going to take us? He says he's going to take us to this place he's been preparing for us, in Correct. the Father's house. We're going to be with him. And yet, the post-tribulation says, no, when Christ comes, the rapture, we're just going to join him in the air, and then we're coming right straight back to the earth. There's going to be no time up there in heaven. So Jesus is then in a feudal building project right now if post-tribulationist view is true. The That's operative words are go and come, mm -hmm. go and come. I go to prepare a place, I will come to receive you. If post-tribulationism were true, it would be I stay to prepare a place and you will already be with me. Yeah. See, so it doesn't fit. Mark, talk about that in terms of uh, it's an analogy with the Jewish wedding, John 14. You're right with that Jewish picture of the bridegroom going and being presented the bride at her family's home and taking her back uh, to his, his father's house, the place that he's been preparing uh, for them to live uh, when they get married. So a lot of that breaks down when you, you take these other views. And again, that's all we're trying to do, as you pointed out, is just, you know, look at the Bible, look at what Scripture says. We don't want to hold to the pre-tribulation view just because we like it better. Mm -hmm. You know, just because, oh, we get to, you know, avoid all this wrath. We hold to this view because we believe it's what the Bible teaches. Yeah, and John, and when you also consider the fact that when we study the individual Scriptures, which is what we've been talking about in these programs, we see both the word church and the portrayal of the bride in the early chapters of Revelation. Then we see her in heaven during the tribulation. And then we see her returning with Christ from heaven at the end. So the portrayal of the bride of Christ is that she somehow gets to heaven while the tribulation is going on. And then at the end of that time, she returns with Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We got one more view here, and that's called the pre-wrath view, Mark. And uh, you cover all of these views in your book in a very, very kind way. The first chapter is basically saying, I can understand why some people have gotten into these views. And then you take all the verses, mm -hmm. you know, basically the Old Testament and New Testament verses that, that talk about the rapture being pre-trib. Uh, but talk about this pre-wrath view. What in the world is that? And why do we think that's not what the Bible is saying? Well, it's, it's the newest, really, of these four views, uh, this pre-wrath. And again, like I said earlier, all the views believe that we're exempt from God's wrath. 
but the pre-wrath view basically places the rapture about three-fourths of the way through the tribulation period. So you have pre-trib before, mid-trib at the middle, post-trib at the end, and then this is kind of a three-quarters uh, rapture view. And what they hold is that the wrath of God or the day of the Lord uh, doesn't uh, happen until that last really one-fourth of that time period. They call that the day of the Lord. So basically they place the rapture between the sixth seal judgment and the seventh seal judgment there in Revelation chapter 6. And they'll say all this wrath is just going to be poured out then. And so that's when we'll be caught up to heaven. And again, one of the problems, as Ron had mentioned earlier with that, is it destroys eminency. Christ can't come at any moment of time now. He's got to wait until at least three-fourths of the, of the time through the tribulation. But another point here I think that's very important is in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 3, the Apostle Paul says that uh, the day of the Lord, when it comes, people are going to be saying peace and safety. And the day of the Lord then is going to come. Well, those who believe in pre-wrath, they say that the day of the Lord starts between the sixth and seventh sealed judgments. Well, if you look at what's happened up to that point of time, people are hardly going to be saying peace and safety <laughs> on the earth during, during that period of time. And so that's just one of the problems that I have with that view. But again, it goes back to the issue of they would say all the, the seal judgments up to that point, the first six seals, are just the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan. The wrath of God is, is just going to be in that last point of time. But all the seal judgments are opened by the Lamb. And so all of those are the judgment of God, the wrath of God being poured out, even though it does increase, again, in its intensity. Yeah. So. Give me a number of how many people will be dead on planet Earth because of the tribulation when we get to the pre rat point? Well, the, the fourth seal judgment, a fourth of the people on the earth will die who are living during that time. It's a staggering number. Yeah. You know, a fourth will die. Then later in the uh, sixth trumpet judgment, a third of the earth die. That's half the people on the earth who are, who are dead. But at least by the time you get to the sixth seal, a fourth of the people in the world are dead during that time. So, again, it's hardly going to be when the day of the Lord comes, people are saying peace and safety. It's going to be devastation that's taking place on right. the earth. Uh, listening to you, you know, we're talking about what are we going to do in the last four programs, which we're going to uh, do coming up. And um, I've got an outline of the book of Revelation that talks about the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bold judgments. And we might just comment on them briefly, but take them through the book of Revelation, maybe in two programs, we'll have to see. Uh, because you guys can do this off the top of your head. It's just that it'll give the folks that have no idea of what the book of Revelation actually says, we're gonna tell them what it says in shorthand. But uh, it'll also pick up with these different viewpoints of when the rapture happens. Let's switch horses here for a moment. And I like the fact that all of us as Christians believe that Jesus is coming back. Mm -hmm. And the timing of when he comes back is what we're debating, all right? And what we're saying is we think that the Bible has some passages that can straighten you out if you spend the time. And we're presenting some books that have the passages all in them. Uh, but what I want to end with in this program is there are people all over the world that may never have heard this. There's people in the United States, in Canada, that are watching us right now that have not heard these views, but they haven't even heard about the fact that the Bible's main message is God's Son's going to come from heaven. So you got the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament and the promise that He's going to come and He comes to earth and He dies on the cross and He pays for everybody's sin that's ever lived, past, present, and future. So if you're living with guilt, if you're anxious about meeting God, we've got great words for you now, and that is that Jesus paid for all of that when He was on the cross. The old verse, God so loved the world. The motivation is there. Why did he send his son to the cross? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him, not works for him, not does 1,200 things for him, but just believes on him that he paid it all. He did all that's necessary when he was on the cross. Our sins were picked up, placed on him, and He took our hell. He took our punishment that we deserve. 
That's what he did on the cross. And then he gave up his spirit and he died. And now he says, grace is out there for you. Grace is that I'm going to offer you a gift that you don't deserve, but I'm going to give it to you if you just believe that I'll save you if you ask me to. Ron, would you talk about this and say a prayer that people could follow with you if sure. they want to have that gift that God will give them? So important, John. I grew up in a church that taught works, so this hits close to home. You can't work yourself into heaven. You can't be good enough for heaven. It's only through Jesus Christ that you can be saved. And in fact, as I've stated before, your salvation is based not on your promises to God, but on His promises to you. And the promise is that if you believe in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. In fact, in Psalm 103, it talks about how God could take your sins and separate them from you as far as the east is from the west. In Hebrews 10, we're told that God can actually forget your sins. Boy, how's that grab you? All based upon Jesus Christ. If you would like that forgiveness, I invite you to pray with me. Father, I thank you so much for Jesus who died on the cross for my sins. He took my punishment. I deserve to be punished, but he took the punishment on the cross. I praise you for that fact. I know that I cannot save myself. I know that I have done things to offend you. I know I've built up a barrier between us. But now I understand from your authoritative word that I can have a relationship with you through Jesus. Today, as promised in John 1.12, I receive you, Lord Jesus. I believe in you as the Savior who not only died for me, but resurrected from the dead. And I now trust your word that I am in your family. And I look forward to all the benefits that have been talked about on this broadcast. I thank you in Jesus' name. If you prayed that, I will see you at the rapture. That's yeah. right. You know, folks, the Bible says, but as many as received Jesus, if you just received him, then Jesus says to them, he gives the power, the power of God to change your life. He puts the Holy Spirit into your life. There are things that you say, I, I could never live the way that Jesus wants me to live. No, you can't by yourself. But if you invite him into your life, he gives you the Holy Spirit of God who helps you and motivates you and changes you from within. And it only can happen if you invite the Lord in and he'll change you. He's the one that changes you and you'll want to do what he says. So I hope that you prayed that prayer with Ron. And again, thank you for joining us this week. And if you'll stay with me for just a moment, I got a personal word for you. I'm gonna tell you what the guys are gonna talk about next week if you'll join us then. Stay tuned, John will be right back. Thanks for joining us today. Jesus said he came to seek and to save those who are lost. He says it was because God so loved the world. He loved you so much that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, Jesus came into this world to pay for your sins. He died on the cross and rose again so that you can be completely forgiven and spend eternity with him. This isn't something you can earn through your own good works. He offers it to you as a free gift, which you can receive through putting your faith in him. If you'd like to do this right now by asking Jesus to be your savior, I invite you to join me in this simple prayer. Just say, Dear God, thank you for loving me. I know I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness right now. I believe Jesus is your son and that he died for all my sins on the cross. I also believe that you raised him from the dead. Right now, I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as my Lord. From this day forward, please give me the strength to live for you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, folks, one day I said a prayer just like that. 
And if you prayed this today, I want you to know what God promises to do for you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. That's you if you just prayed this prayer. And if you did, I want you to see what God says he will do. He says, shall be saved. That's what God does. He promises to save you. Now, if you would like to watch more programs from the John Ankerberg Show again, or share it with a friend, you can do so for free on your phone through our app. Just go to the app store on your device and search for Ankerberg. Once you download it, you can watch this series again, as well as over a hundred other programs, anytime, anywhere, absolutely free. To find these videos in your language, simply open up our app and tap on the languages. Another valuable resource for you is our discipleship course. In this free 40 lesson discipleship course, our special guests, Sunder and Shamala Krishnan, will guide you step by step and through what it means to follow Jesus. Whether you are a new believer or have been following Jesus for a while, this course will help you grow in your walk with God. You can use it personally, in your small group, or share it with a friend. Just go to the JA Show app and tap on Online Courses, or go online at jabible.org to check it out. Along with this, our app lets you read and even listen to the Bible in over a thousand languages. Simply tap on the Bible icon displayed on the main page of our app to find your own language. Once it opens, you can find your language by tapping on the second box at the top. If you have never read or listened to the Bible, I encourage you to find your language and check it out for yourself. The Gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are a great place to start. Thanks again for joining us today. I hope you tune in this time next week for another episode of The John Ankerberg Show. Until then, God bless, and I'll see you next week. But here's the, what Ezekiel says in chapter 38, 1 through 6. Ezekiel says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. We're going to translate these into these geographical areas into modern names in just a minute. The prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws, and I'll bring you out and all your army horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords.